I prayed and I prayed. It sounds like a song. <laughs> it is a song, but for real, I prayed asking the Lord for direction because I would like to tackle another book, but it's like which book to tackle, you know? This just, everything is good. Everything is, every part of the scripture is like, okay, where do you go first? So in really in seeking and praying diligently, I could not escape a book that probably has had the least amount of commentaries written over it. Yay! <laughs> and, and probably because it's, it's somewhat misunderstood in its application, but I'm going to take you into 1 Peter, the epistle of Peter, the first epistle of Peter. And I want to make sure that you understand, just like we, we have done, I will weave in and out of a series. It does not mean that every week that we come together that we will dig into this. But there's, a, there's so many good reasons why this book. Certainly, after the Gospels, and certainly after the writings of Paul, we then really, after you've had the meat and potatoes put down, you begin to look at what other books cover such great issues. And I think First Peter has been greatly kind of put aside, primarily because there's been much debate about its authorship. And I'm going to cover a little bit of that. I don't want to get too bogged down on making a defense it was canonized, obviously. It bears the name of the writer. So it would be safe to conclude based on internal and external evidences that Peter, the follower of Jesus Christ, and now apostle, wrote this book. There are a few questions that need to be answered, and there are tons of corrections and tons of goodies to dig into. First thing I'd like to say is 105 verses, if we're going counting by verse, and packed within this writing is something very strange. See, in Paul's writing, Paul will always say, the prophet Isaiah said, or quoting the scripture, thus saith, and quoting the scripture. Peter's writing has tons of scripture in it but it's not outlined in direct quotations. And that's what's remarkable, is when you begin to study where, where people were arguing whether or not this had enough meat in it, and actually said it, it looked slightly Pauline in its writing, but it maybe was written by somebody under a pseudonym of Peter. I'd happen to say, no, based on at least this, this beginning investigation, and as we go, I think there'll be enough evidence that will be very confirming not only his use of Scripture, the particular uses of Scripture, the particular books that he's paraphrasing from, lots of concepts that you can't miss them. Once they're highlighted, you can't miss them. So I'm going to just cover a little bit of why, external evidences of why I'm going to go with the authorship. And as I said, I don't want to get too loaded down. But the first thing we can deduce is that there are obviously first and second writings of Peter. And in the second writing, he says, this is the second time I'm writing to you. Now, that doesn't mean that there wasn't another letter called the first and then that guarantees. But just by virtue, what are the chances of somebody writing a second time and saying, this is the second time I'm writing you? So there are internal evidences like that that are simple. There are external evidences, and I'm going to read because I made some notes it was very tenuous or strainingful, if you will, to read from some of the writings where people chronicle Polycarp writing to the Philippians. And through Polycarp's writing, there is more paraphrasing of Peter's writing. For example, let me give you an example of this. Polycarp writing to the Philippians, and he, he's writing things in his letter that sound like this, though you did not see him, you believed with inexpressible and glorious joy, whom having not seen you love. 
That's right out of Peter's writing. Therefore, gird up your loins, believing in him who raised our Lord Jesus from the dead and gave him glory. That's right out of Peter's writing. These are all, remember, church fathers were very quick to take up and absorb writing that was circulating. So not only this external, and I could keep going because there are so many references from Polycarp, not returning evil for evil or, or reviling for reviling or cursing for cursing out of 1 Peter 3, zealots for good, 1 Peter 3. These are all quotations out of Polycarp's writing. Who bore our sins in his own body to the tree, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. More quotations out of Peter from Polycarp. So if you're a church historian studying church history, I don't want to bore you with Polycarp's verbiage, but go and try and find some of his writings to the Philippians, and you'll be astounded at how much he is quoting out of Second, uh, First Peter, rather. Tertullian, who addresses the topic of Peter rather lightly, but in his writing, I'm going to pray I say this right, Scorpiaci, 12 and 14, which talks much about the writings of First and Second Peter. And the famous Bodmer Papyri, you always hear me talking about the Chester Beatty Papyri, P46. Everybody here knows what P46 is, almost everybody. Hang around for a while and you will, I guarantee you, if you don't. But there's another, there's tons of Papyri, they're just numbered. The Bodmer Papyri, Papyri P72 as it's called, contains the full writings of First and Second Peter in their entirety. And those are probably about third century document, so it's pretty substantial evidence that backs up some solid external evidences for which I'm not here to defend today. I'm just touching on it lightly. The other thing that is of interest for us as we study this is there are other factors to consider internally. Peter identifies himself in the opening of this epistle as Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And Later on, as we read, we'll conclude there are several places where Peter says, I, the writer speaking for himself, I, I am an elder as well as an eyewitness, I, which is pretty good confirmation within the letter, just this one where he says, I'm an elder and an eyewitness to the sufferings of Christ. He says witness, but he's meaning eyewitness is quite suggestive that this is the same Peter that the Gospels chronicle as having been with our Lord while he walked among us. So there are many things like that to glean. There's the question of who Peter was writing to. And this will bring me into verse 1 almost immediately. A question of who he's writing to and why he was writing. You know, let me just pretend for a minute. Imagine if I could take this, what is, five Five, chap five chapters. Imagine if I could technically remove this from my Bible. I wouldn't do it because eventually it will fall out anyway like Revelation did. <laughs> but if I could remove it and tell you just for a brief moment to walk back in time pretending that there are no other books or scrolls available to the layperson. And I just said you only have this scroll which represents five chapters for your instruction. And that opens up a whole new light because if we read 1 Peter, we're so spoiled. We have it nestled in neatly among all the other writing. We forget that this writer communicating to a people would receive only what we are calling five chapters. And the reason for the writing and the receivers or the recipients of the writing become extremely relevant and the reason why. Now, if you fall into the category of people who do not believe that Peter, the one that was with Jesus, the one that denied Jesus, if you fall into the category where you believe that he did not write this, you will be one of those that says, well, obviously this Peter is writing to people in Asia Minor who were under such severe persecution, and those severe waves of, and successive waves of persecution only began after, about the time of Nero to Peter and Paul's death through maybe 112 as the first massive 60 years of attack on Christians 
in Asia Minor. But that's if you're in the category that believes that Peter was Peter the disciple, was not the writer. I happen to believe, for this reason, it is Peter, because he is giving comfort. This whole letter is comfort to believers who are going to endure. It is an epistle for the ages, who are going to endure suffering and persecution for Christ's sake. You know, I would say the missing message of the church, too many people are ready to nitpick selectively out of Scripture the massage technique of how to make it palatable. Peter didn't make it palatable. He said, listen, you're partakers in Christ's suffering. There's more mentioning in this epistle to the precious saints of God suffering for Christ's sake than anything else. And he says, but listen, I'm going to give you the good news, but I'm also, first I'm going to tell you the bad news. Lots of suffering. But don't be too troubled, because if you keep your eyes focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, a greater glory awaits you eternally, no matter what's going on in your life now. Folks, this is what's so disturbing to me. This is a book for the ages. You know, there are books that instruct us doctrinally, and this does. There are books that instruct us in comfort, like the Psalms do, giving us comfort in a time of need, like this does. In fact, that's what was so perplexing me. Why has nobody really touched it? It contains more connections to being born again and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the hope and glory that's in Christ than almost any other writing apart from Paul's writing. So, you say to me, let's start first with looking at what the Greek says, and I want to point out very quickly, little by little as we progress in picking apart things, there are times I'm going to bring you the documents and I'm going to say, here, look at the documentation. There's other times where I'm going to just tell you, take my word for it, and you can go look it up on your own and deal with it, right? So, having said that so nicely and kindly, the letter opens with Peter, Petros, Peter, Apostle, Apostolos, Jesu Christu, and because this is genitive, it is of Jesus Christ. And here is my first glitch, this word eklektois. So before I get here, which is being translated in your Bibles as elect, but before I get there, let's just make one thing certain. Peter defines himself immediately as a sent one, an apostle. I hear so many folks in the modern church world, and forgive me for you old timers, you say this is review, but I get very frustrated when I hear some of these new fangled people that come out and they've got new ideas about things. This is apostle so-and-so of the first church of so-and-so. And it's like, wait a minute, let's get one thing straight. If you don't think you're a sent one, if you don't think that you're called or sent, you shouldn't be speaking. That's the first place. I mean, you know, there's too many people walking around the body of Christ that are not called and they're not sent, that want to put a title or they want to put a, you know, listen, I could go off on that subject and tell you a lot. This simply means Peter is saying he's a sent one. And anyone who is listening and hearing to the voice of the sent one, will hear something else. He says he's not sent of himself, but of Jesus Christ. And this is what I love. You'll know why I do grammar as I do it, just to pepper in some ideas for you. The genitive makes sure to tell us that he is sent, not of his own, but the genesis of the sending, the emitter of the sending, the one who is saying, go, is Jesus Christ. And I love that because it confirms, just simple grammar confirms the rest of Scripture. Peter, an apostle, is sent one of Jesus Christ, and here comes my, my troublemaker word here. You're going to love this because I, I'm now beginning to see why trouble comes and trouble does. Let's read what it says here in your King James. Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. 
And you'll see there is a comma right there. And then verse 2 in the, in the King James begins with elect. How many have that like that? It should, you should all have that if you're reading out of the King James. They did something funny, which has spawned doctrines unbelievable. See, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. But that's not the way the Greek reads, and it's very important. It's imperative, to use a grammar term, that I show you why this, in the Greek, this word which is being translated as elect, which appears in your verse 2, it's important that I show you that it actually sits right after Jesus Christ. And the relevance to that is that it is an adjective modifying a pronoun. And forgive me, if you're not a grammar person, just tune me out for a minute. The problem with this whole sentence structure, this is the way it should read. Peter, apostle of Jesus Christ, and because this is a dative adjective, it would technically two, and I'm going to put here two chosen, and I'm going to put in brackets ones. This is my translation. Uh, elect conjures up, even though that is the word, elect conjures up some of the most damnable ideas which have divided the church and I guarantee you, Peter, simple fisherman, Peter was not engaging in predestination and uh, the wind-up theory that has been propagated just out of this verse alone. Now, the calling and election of God falls into another verse, not here. Here is simply what's going to come of this. is He says, Peter, apostle of Jesus Christ, and let's look at this for a minute. This word here, ek, out, and this clay word, the called, is from the same essence, not the same word, but from the same essence as we get the ecclesia, the out-called ones. Single-handedly in Scripture, when this word occurs, which it does in the New Testament 22 times, it has to do with God choosing people from among others he did not choose. 22 times in different, different ways as it appears. And the reason that this makes perfect sense in the Greek, and then when you, once you get to the English, it starts, go, you go, elect according to the, huh? And that spawns a doctrine which Peter was not intending to do. He's making a statement, and I'm going to try and define it so we understand. Let's look at the rest of this, and then we'll pull it all together. Your King James says strangers, doesn't not? Strangers? Oy, okay. The word in the Greek, let's write it first phonetically for you. Pare, pare, pi, vimois. Okay, let's split this word up. One, two, so you've got one word here, two word, three word. Para would be alongside along or beside, epi, we'll call it at, upon, or even amongst, and demos, from where we get the word demographic, populace, all right? From among the people, the populace as a, as a whole. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, that is, he is sent of Jesus Christ. This word, the chosen, the elect, as your King James reads, which is an adjective, and I'm going to explain why it's an adjective and why it's not a pronoun, which changes the whole sentence meaning. To the chosen ones, as I've elected to put this in here and add this for the sake of translation, the alongside or amongst people those that have been chosen out from among those living amongst the people. Genitive lets me put of. And here, diaspora, we get our English word, diaspora. But let's break this down. Dia, through, and spora, from to sow, to scatter, and there's some other words if you look up in the Strong's, but that's enough to kind of give 
the sentence structure. And I've left off the cities because at the end of Bithynia, your King James reads with a comma, and then verse 2 begins. Now, why is this important? Because there's so much confusion about people talking about election. And not too many people will take the position to explain the grammar first and let the grammar speak for itself. I really believe that Peter was not thinking that he was writing something so complicated. He's writing to these people who have been scattered. And this is what becomes important. When people have made commentaries on this, they say, well, Peter's writing, the recipients of this letter have to be, the word diaspora is always used, of Jews. And we know that Peter, it says of him that he was apostle to the circumcision. So it's got to be that he's writing only to Jews. And I would have to say, this epistle says absolutely not. You like that? He's writing to a body, Jew and Gentile. Listen carefully. Thirty-some years has passed since the day of Pentecost. I put this writing, for me personally, in the early 60s. All right? That's how, based on not just my word, but all of the best sources that you can find, very early 60s. Very. And it would be safe to say that 30-some years perhaps has passed since the day of Pentecost. And reflect a little bit on how the gospel in the book of Acts, it says it was spreading like wildfire. And the church in one day, look what happened in one day now. Can you imagine with all of these people going around and preaching, even the few that we have record of, how many people would have heard in 30 years that area? which we tend to think of as either great, a great mass territory or some small little confined area. Why this becomes important to me is because Peter is saying something that is very revelatory, and he wasn't trying to talk about election as we have made it into a doctrine. Let me start back at the first place. Let's talk about this diaspora. If you read... The Old Testament, the people were carried away into captivity in 586. That was one of the successive waves, and the other one in 712, one into Babylon, the other one by the Assyrians. You have successive waves of people being carried away, and those who came back, those would be referred to as either the remnant sometimes in Scripture, but they were scattered abroad. So after the captivity, some remained in that land, others stayed and the point I'm making is that if we're using that term, and if Peter was only writing to Jews, it would make perfect sense to just explain this as the diaspora of scattered Jews. But he's not saying that. And the reason why, I have to be clear about this, the reason why is through this he will make some certain statements that will lead you to think at the first he's speaking to Jews, but then he says things like the ignorance. Let me read some of the scriptures to make clear what I'm saying, because otherwise you'll say, well, I don't really get what she's saying here, and I want you to get it. And I've got a plethora of notes here, so bear with me for a minute. All right. For example, in 1 Peter 1 and 14, he says, As obedient children, not fashion yourselves according to the former lust of your ignorance, and then well, that could lend to go in any direction because the, your former ignorance could mean that you were not aware of or that you were ignorant in the traditions of your father. But he goes on to say something else in verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, behavior, received by tradition from your fathers, which could be Remember, silver and gold, he doesn't say from tablets of stone, which could conjure up in the mind that these were idol worshipers, just as well as Jews, Gentile, Jew, Gentile. So I'm going to tell you, until we get in and pull apart some of these very important concepts, I'm going to say he's writing to the scattered, sown people of God, 
chosen out from among to the diaspora. It is definitely a scattered people. People living amongst other people who are, as an adjective, chosen. It demystifies and, and makes it less like some elect group of people here that are in this special little box. When you take a look at the map and how far reaching this territory is, you can better understand the term diaspora being used is the scattering of people. And I do not believe wholeheartedly. I always tell you when I have an opinion, this is opinion versus fact. Everything I've given you to date has been fact. But my opinion is, I believe the greatest waves of persecution had not yet hit, but people were suffering and being persecuted for the cause of Christ already. So it's safe to say he's not writing to a single group in a church. I believe, if you turn to the last chapter, uh, chapter 5 and verse 12 of 1 Peter, you'll see there is a culmination of the letter in verse 11. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Then verse 12 says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. And of course, we even get a flavor here of where Peter's writing from because he uses the word Babylon, and we'll get to that. We'll tackle that of where he is writing from and why he's, he says Babylon. We'll explain that in a minute. I'll tackle that. But Silvanus, which I happen to believe is Silas, the same Silas that Paul would have known, I believe that he faithful brother unto you, carried this letter cyclically in a whole circle. And each place where the letter was delivered to each of these cities, if you recognize how large the territory is, you're going to come to the conclusion that it wasn't the church at Cappadocia, for example. It was a body of believers. And that's where the eclectois come into, we come into a better understanding that amongst all of these different places scattered throughout Asia Minor, there were ones who were chosen living amongst the populace, the King James calling them strangers. And it becomes obvious that this is not a question of some type of doctrine of specific election. You see, when the King James translators took that elect and put it down into verse 2, they did something really terrible. They made the word elect begin to modify. Remember, look at my word elect up there. It's an adjective. An adjective, we say something that defines or modifies a noun, giving description, for example. So if elect was, a, was beside where the King James translators put it, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, I want you to look at something. Then the elect adjective would also have to modify the sanctification of the Spirit and also the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Can't. It doesn't. It modifies the chosen ones. is modifying the people, the populace, these people here that are living amongst other people in a land of being scattered throughout this region. When you put it in that frame, you start stepping away from a concept of election that's not so scary. Do you know what I'm saying? The church world has managed to make it so scary that we don't even deign to touch this because it's so confusing. And if you see where the King James translators put this elect, you begin to see why it could be problematic because it would be elect according to. And although they were elect according to because it is God who does the choosing, I guarantee you, I have to do this because it's the only way I can explain this and you're going to say, wow, I have to do this carefully. There's only a select group of people here who will appreciate this and if you're offended, my apologies for, no, I'm not sorry. <laughs> okay, let's keep generic here, Scott. Um, I saw a, a certain animated program on television, on Comedy Central. 
That narrows it down remotely. And in this uh, animated program, these children wrote a book. And they just wrote a book. It was just a silly book. And when the adults began to read the children's books, they were saying how it had some political liberal message in it, and others said it had some other message in it. Now, if you know the program, please don't shout it out. I don't want us to confess that we actually, we, we were actually watching that show together, perhaps. <laughs> but these were just kids writing a book. And the adults had every imagination that you could possibly read into. Just a simple, a simple story becomes, oh, how, how deeply psychological and the, the ramifications. And it was like psychobabble. While the adults were, were reading this material, the kids just wrote it as just a gaffe, right? OK, take that same concept. And too many people will go to scripture and they will read into the scripture so much that is not there that you begin to say, what? which book are you reading? You know, I read Greek, and I really do believe hermeneutics and the study of God's word theology, extremely important, but we have to also read what's there and sometimes not go too far beyond. There's reading between the lines, and then there's putting stuff in there that was never meant to be there in the first place. So... It is with this word elect. And a great confusion, which I can't solve in an hour, arises from this. Let me point something out very quickly, and I think you'll, you'll get to see a better picture of why this election, eclectois, is so vitally important, crucial to understanding where it belongs in the sentence, and then we can move on. In Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 22, at the end of the wedding feast, the banquet, the very end of that passage culminates with Jesus saying, many are called and few are chosen. And if you read that scripture properly, it really gives you an idea of what this means. He says, many are kletois, but few are ekletois. That helps to understand a little bit how when people say they begin with this doctrine and they take you through the steps of then make sure your, your election, that you are part of God's elect. Listen, let me go back to a few weeks ago when I was talking about prevenient grace and the initiative starts with God. And God takes people right where they're at. And that passage out of Matthew helps us to bridge the gap in understanding that the called, those that are called, still had to have had ears to hear. That's the missing ingredient. And a lot of times when people talk about the calling and choosing, listen, a caller has to have ears to know that he's being called or to have responded to a message. Is that true? Yes, ma'am. You have to have ears to be able to at least know that, hey, you at the back of the room. Yes, right? So it is with God. And out of those who are called, he says, many are called, few are chosen. Now, we don't know what the few is. That's the problem with Christianity and people who get into the doctrine of election. They say, well, there's this number that God knows he has to have, or, or there's this group of people that God knows he's going to save, and the rest of them are just going to hell in a handbasket or whatever vehicle they want to go in. <laughs> you know, I'm going to tell you something, because I, I love theology, but I'm going to tell you, I think too much of the church will spend too much time talking about how to box God in and how to put him in this convenient box so we've mastered the, the creator of the universe, and then we can get on with things versus letting God be exactly who he is, and we supposedly, if I remember correctly, we're supposedly the clay who doesn't talk back to the potter and say, what are you making? And in that framework, God so can choose whomever he wills. And I do not believe, I'm sorry, when we get into this doctrine and the ideas of doctrine, I do not believe for a minute that the apostle Peter was trying to say this select group 
putting it right next to the foreknowledge of God. And paradoxically, God who knows, it does not mean that he knows and lays out this road map and says, here, you walk on this narrow way, which is what most of the church people tell you to do, and God help you if you should fall, because we'll make sure while you're down, we just give you a good little <laughs> kick, move you on. But as a loving father, see, I read this aright, because I looked at all the use inside this epistle. Peter speaking of God and all the references to God and all the references to Christ and all the references to the Holy Spirit just within this small little epistle. And when he comes to talk about this foreknowledge, guess what? Which is later in verse 2. Foreknowledge of God or the prognosin we get our word to uh, prognosis, the prognosis of someone's condition. But the foreknowledge of God is not, again, bound up to the election or the elect to the point where God says, this is what it is and you better walk in that exact way because he gave us free will. And I know all about free will, trust me. Some of you will get that later. Free will is the ability for us to do our own thing and make mistakes, yes? yes? That's what I said. So, and if you don't know that, then I can't help you. But we'll find out that this prognosin of God the Father is not necessarily being defined by Peter as this wind-up clock so much as a father who knows his children even in an earthly dimension, a father gets to know his child or his children to where you know them by name. I, I hope you know your children as an earthly father by name. Oh, kid, get over here. <laughs> and that we come to know him. Now I'm speaking of our heavenly father. How much more? I'm speaking in earthly dimension. How much more our heavenly father? And it is in that concept of the foreknowledge of God, where God who knows his children, as the song says, he leads his dear children along, who knows his children, I would go so far as to say that the concepts just described in verse 1 and the beginning of verse 2 lead me to believe something. Peter was not speaking in the eternities. And I distinguish that by... For example, putting Peter's writing beside John's. And John, when he wrote, he wrote about God in the eternities. He spoke of the eternal God, that God that in the beginning, that's how his gospel begins, from the eternity standpoint, the relationship of God the Father and the Son. Peter's perspective is the present salvation because he says in the now, and he'll repeat this, in the now, in the now. And his focus is not on a past orientation of election in the body of Christ, if you want to use verbiage, but in the now. So too bad for all those great uh, ideas where people have tried to confuse. Now, having laid this out, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, he didn't say, I, I started my first Peter, my first church, the church of Peter. No, he says, a sent one from the beginner, the starter, the foundation, the architect, the first goer of faith, Jesus Christ, and speaking to these that are chosen out from among those living amongst the populace that are scattered throughout these areas of Asia Minor. Now, I've given you the, the breakdown, a little bit of grammar, not too much. I just talked about an adjective. That's all I did, so don't say, oh, the grammar's killing me. <laughs> That's, that may be next week's torture for some of you. <laughs> but I do want to point this out to you. Now, having said that, you can just see the beginning of this letter that he's writing, Peter is writing 
to God's people. And if there was such a way to put it to where it would be better said, so we quit looking at this word and making it some mystical gobbledygook, to God's people. God's people scattered all over, and I would say to us today, because even though the letter is to a scattered people of Asia Minor that he was writing to, this is who we are as Christians. Again, everything I'm going to say probably flies in the face of every other evangelist or teacher out there saying, hey, we be a body belonging to another body, belonging to another body. No, there's one body, all have different parts, and the concept that Peter is connecting us in the framework of the today for the church today is a scattered people just across the globe. There are people listening to me right now, and I know our brothers and sisters in, in Ireland, some of our brothers and sisters in Asia or in India, all over the place, across America, scattered, representing the people of God. And something that just leaped out in my mind, I said, you know, he was speaking to a people that were suffering persecution, which became intensified. We're still a persecuted people, not persecuted the way these first Christians were, but still persecuted. Jesus said, if you are of the world, the world would love its own, but you're not of the world. I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, you know, you can, you can try and be buddies with the world and say, we all have something in common. Yes, we do. But when it comes to the Bible and understanding about what is the directives here, we don't. People of God are pilgrims. Probably the most important word that I've set aside for a minute. Your King James begins with to the strangers. I said to you, that word for strangers is not strangers. Yes, strangers suggest, strangers scattered abroad suggest, who is that? person at the back of the room. I don't know them. They're a stranger. That's what it suggests. The Greek word suggests just chosen ones living amongst the populace that are scattered throughout. Now, to, if, if you don't believe why we do what we do is so important, I wanted to show you a subtlety of something, and you'll say, couldn't they make up their minds? In verse 1, we have the word strangers. That very same word is being translated in 2.11, 1 Peter 2.11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers, not that word, and pilgrims. That word pilgrims is the same word as strangers. They just couldn't make up their minds. So we just, it's like a juggling act. We'll just use a, uh, okay. Now to me, a pilgrim, we think about a pilgrim. We think about a journey to an unknown land. That's the idea that pilgrim conjures up. Stranger someone who doesn't belong, who are you? Do I know you? And if that's not bad enough, oh, you know, I brought with, I have two of these. One's a contemporary parallel New Testament. This one is the precise parallel New Testament. The precise. <laughs> but Oxford. Just to give you an idea of why we do what we do, because it's important. If we're going to study the word and then make an application to us, I want us to know the difference between strangers and pilgrims, and the concept of whether this is just a people who were carried away in captivity, who then got released and spread out through the world, or is this, who are these people? Let's just read through a few of these just to tell, give you an idea of the confusion. In the Amplified Bible, this very opening, and I want you to take note of two things, who are being described as strangers and where the word elect is going to occur in every sentence. I'm going to read them to you in a few translations. Amplified Bible, Peter, an apostle. Amplified Bi Bible has these little uh, brackets. A special messenger. Special. Isn't that special? Of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Aren't you glad I'm human? <laughs> Who knew that the Bible could be so fun? Writing to the elect exiles of the dispersion, scattered, sowed abroad in Pontius. Now, let me stop there for a minute, because the Amplified Bible gives us the idea exiles. An exile is someone who's been carried away against their will. So you've got to kind of put that aside for a minute. 
and they put elect exiles, they put it in the right place, but guess what they do? Down in verse 2, they had to just fix this, so they, they took elect and they left it in verse 1, and then they said, who were chosen and foreknown by God? They had to bring that word back into the foreknowledge of God because it, it just got to belong there. Okay. Let me just point something out, which is also very important. There is no direct, there is no the, all right? So the Greek just has diaspora. And because it's genitive, it's of. Of, which could also be by means of, the scattering, through the scattering. And there, because there is no the, the, it is not defining a particular event. That's the other thing with grammars. It lets you really read and see what it really says. So it's not defining an event. Next, let me give you another one. New American Standard Bible. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens. <laughs> do, 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 do. That's not the type of aliens they were talking about, though. They were, but I, I understand this a little bit better because um, aliens in the dimension of a uh, resident alien, someone who lives in a land but does not technically belong there, that's starting to sound a little bit more like us because we live here but we really don't belong here. If we're looking at Jesus and our heaven bound, we really don't belong here. Getting a little bit closer, and they, in this New American Standard Bible, put who are chosen right beside according to the foreknowledge of God. NIV, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout, blah, 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 who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and so forth. Now, if you don't see why this is important, believe you me, when we get into discussing this topic which will occur at some point again in this letter, which will occur eventually when we study Romans. It will occur in other places. I really want it to be put out there that it is not some easy, oh, well, this is just a piece of cake, but nor is it so complicated that people have made volumes of books, and particularly out of this particular scripture, which when we get to understanding the foreknowledge of God, it will be repeated again, the foreknowledge of God for other things. We'll see that Peter, who I believe was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write and to lay this out very carefully. You know, in the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, the religious leaders say, but this is an unlearned man. He's unlearned. He's not schooled. And that has been the critique of almost every single commentator saying, but Peter wasn't a good uh, learned person. Therefore, how could he write such proficient Greek and blah, 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 blah. And I would just say now, having a little bit of knowledge, a man named John Bunyan, who didn't have a super education, was somewhat unlearned, penned a great deal, and they weren't too shabby. His writings weren't too shabby, uh, if you don't know John Bunyan's works. Or even a simple man like Conrad, who his understanding of English came to him as a third language, <laughs> and he wrote a novel that was claimed as a literary masterpiece. Now, we're talking about the things of God. God can take an unlearned person and put the words in their mouth so that when they're, when Peter was scribing what God wanted to communicate would come through and be communicated, and we, along the way, take the liberty to mess it up and confuse people and then suck them into these ideas that somehow, if you don't understand what election is, please don't tell me you're not voting. No. <laughs> All right. What else does it say? Because I want to just cover this. This is an introduction there's so much more to say, but I want to make sure I at least cover the nuts and bolts here. One more. Let me give it to you from the, oh, well, there's a 
kind of interesting translation here, but I'll give you the new century version. One more after this, and then I'll be done, I think. New century version says, from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's chosen people who are away from their homes. <laughs> I don't know. Do you know? I don't know. Or I would like to also quote from the Massage Bible. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what the Massage Bible is, stick around. It's the Message Bible, but I call it the Massage Bible. I, Peter, am an apostle on assignment by Jesus, the Messiah, writing to exile scattered to the four winds. <laughs> now, truth be known, the message did reach the four corners or, or is in the process of reaching the four corners of the earth, but no, he wasn't writing to the four winds and he wasn't writing to exiles. Just God's chosen people scattered. Now, now that I've laid down the foundation and the introduction, let me just say one thing. Peter is going to go on to talk about these elect living among the populace or living amongst the people who have been scattered, these who have been scattered living amongst the populace. And he's going to talk about these people in the sense of, now we'll go back to using it for the sake of facility, as those on a journey eulogizing God in whatever state they're in. And the whole message, this whole small, tiny epistle, will bring, at least for those of us who are going on this journey, will at least bring some comfort to the knowledge, perhaps we don't have it as bad as these folks did, but this epistle to me resonates with hope and encouragement. You know, things that we often lift out of here, casting your cares upon him for he, he cares all about you. These concepts that, to me, if I only had my five chapters here that I was reading and had no other Bible and had nothing else to refer to, I, do, I would at least know reading this, there is a resurrection that Jesus Christ did raise from the dead. There would be, at least for me, an understanding about the future hope and glory that awaits me for my faith. Simple, simple things peppered in here of encouragement for those of us who are, by the way, living amongst the demois, living amongst the people. A scattered bunch we are, walking by faith. And the beauty of this book is, I believe, more than any other self-help, more than any other book that's been heralded up in modern times, even the power of positive thinking, cannot achieve what this does. It brings comfort to the soul to know I'm on a journey and you're on a journey and I'm, guess what, in this case, I'm not making this journey alone. I don't have to face the trials alone. You can read through this and at least take comfort in this. The very words being used to describe this living amongst or aside the populace were used of Abraham when God called him. And believe you me, he was no stranger to his neighbors. Certainly wherever he went, people probably knew who he was. There goes the guy, father of many, and he has no kids. Wow. <laughs> and it's chronicled and used the same way the writer of the Hebrews uses the same verbiage. From Abel clear to Abraham, the same word, living amongst the people, is spoken of in that same way. And it is, by the way, the faith connection of those men and women that kept eternity in view. That means when everything is falling apart. And, you know, not every week is like that, and not every day is bad. Not every day. Just some days, and some days are worse than others. But you've heard rejoice in your tribulations. You've heard and read from so many different parts of the book, what leaps to my mind is Romans 5. Rejoice. Well, it's not always easy to rejoice. It's not always happy while, a happy time while stuff is flying at you and you just, you read and think those scriptures through and you say, well, I'm just grateful that God's in my life somewhere, right? <laughs> Except this scripture says, take comfort because God cares about you. And this letter 
was sent to the people living amongst, scattered and living amongst the people as a letter of encouragement to say, no matter what you're facing, God's going to be with you and see you through. And guess what? If Peter, whose ultimate fate, if you think about this, God's going to see you through. His death, spoken of, perhaps alluded to in John 21, and certainly chronicled in Fox's Book of Martyrs at Rome, which I said I would touch on, another message. Certainly we can say Peter had the certainty of the knowledge that his faith, who, whose eyes had seen the risen Savior, whose eyes had proclaimed Mr. Pentecost, who now is telling other people, Keep your eyes fixed on God no matter what happens. Keep your eyes fixated there. Dies this death, crucified upside down. I'm not worthy to die like my Lord. Immortalized the book now, which becomes publicized, spread like wildfire throughout Asia Minor and then the rest of the world, it sends the message, God is with you even when you don't think God is with you. People of God. You are his chosen people, spread amongst the populace, living amongst the people, but he is with us. I pray this series will bring us some comfort and some faith handles, some new ones maybe, to grab hold of when things get a little tough. Reach in and hold on if it's with just, as it's been said, just a fingernail grip. Latch on and don't let go. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.